Right. Welcome, everybody. Now, we've had our two days of mini comps. We've had two wonderful keynote speakers already, but what we all know is what we're here for is the speakers in the conference proper. They're what you've paid your good money to come and see. And so today starts, and as our very first session, starting us off on conference proper with our speakers is... There you are. <laughs> Simon Lee's here, and he's going to talk about his robots. Malcolm, make him welcome. So good morning, everyone. So today I'm t talking to you about how you may or may not create a Linux-powered robot that looks something like this, and the things you might run into, and things you should consider. Um, so, firstly, a little bit about me. Um, I've been working at SUSE for almost two years. Um, I previously worked for a radio comms company doing graphical design, rapid prototyping, a bit of systems engineering. And so a lot of the experience that I had there is probably what made making my robot easy. And I maintained open of things for years. So yes, it is a trap. You have all been sucked into coming to a boring systems engineering lecture with the promise of shiny things like robots, but we'll try and keep it fun and entertaining. And so why would you want to make a robot? Um, it is a interesting question. And my simple answer is because you can. Why wouldn't you want to make a robot? Robots are fun to drive around. They're fun to have. So you should make a robot. Personally, I was inspired um, by some bad robots back when I was in primary school, which would have been many years ago. Some people brought in these robots, and then nothing more with them boxes that got pushed in and had some LEDs. And I thought, they're not proper robots. If you want to have a proper robot, it has to be able to drive itself around, has to have speech recognition, has to do all those fun things. It has to basically be like R2D2 or C3PO. That's what I thought of as robots. And so from that point on, I thought to myself, one day, I'm going to make myself a better robot. And eventually, I had enough knowledge, and I started doing that. And the other cool thing about robots is they are never finished. You can always have a list of things this long that you could add one day when you're bored and have a spare few minutes. And money. And money, yes. So how should you start your project? And tying in with the theme of this conference, I think often when we go to start our projects, we think, oh, I could do this, 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 and we just dive headfirst into design, at least. Normally when I start a project, I would dive headfirst into design. But rather than doing that, what should we do? We should, of course, look back at the past, see what other people have done, see what's already there, and see how much of it we can reuse. Because if we can put together a bunch of things that other people have done, it's going to save us a lot of time and effort and we're going to get to spend more time doing the fun bits we want to do and less time doing boring bits. So the first question you should ask yourself is, what in your project do you suck at? What things do you have to do that you absolutely suck at? And once you know that, go find someone else to do it for you. <laughs> go find a project that does it. Go find something you can buy off the shelf that does it. Because if you spend your time having to do with all the things you're not good at and you hate, you'll get bored of the project very quickly, and you'll move on to the next project. I am a good one for doing this. And so, as a sidestep, why would you want to use Linux to make a robot? Going back to what I was saying before, there is text-to-speech applications. Setting up Wi-Fi is easy. Setting up video is easy. There is a number of things Linux does really well that is easy and makes your life good when you want to make something more advanced. But the other question is, why wouldn't you use Linux to do a robot? Trying to do things quickly in real time on Linux is just hard and annoying. And so basically, the way I got around that is I am using Linux and an Arduino because making motors go with an Arduino is easy. And again, it's about taking components that will make your life as easy as possible so you can make something in a few evenings that looks cool. And so moving on a bit further, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the design of this robot, maybe in enough detail that you could go by all these things 
and make your own copy, or buy all these things or similar things and adapt it to make something that you want. So personally for me, hardware is hard. It's the thing I suck at. And for a long time, this project wasn't started because there was no good hardware. I didn't want a tiny little toy robot that you drive around on a table. I wanted something you could take outside, something you could drive over things, something that was a bit more fun. And so, and I also really wanted something with tank tracks. And such a thing only really existed in the market if you were willing to spend thousands of dollars on a commercial platform. And at the time, two or three years back when I started this, I didn't have spare money to do that. This was a fun project. So I was contemplating and toying over getting an RC car and turning that into a robot. And then one day I was browsing AliExpress and all of a sudden these metal chassis appeared and there is a variety of them in different sizes. And so I, so I thought, cool, now I finally found someone to do the hard bit for me, I might actually start working on the rest of this project. So the second part for me is I'm a software engineer. I have worked with electronics enough to understand it basically, but I am no great electrician. And so I knew I had to, had several problems I needed to solve. And so I, as all people do, sort of resorted to Google. So the first thing I had to solve was providing power. And as any good software engineer does, I took a guess and I bought the big, and because I was using 12 volt motors, I bought the biggest battery somewhere near 12 volts that I could find. In this case, I'll, let's see if we can make this fanciness work. Mm. Uh, oh, where are we going? Sorry, we are going back. Here we go. So I have a little camera here, and you can sort of see the robot if I zoom out. Now, hiding under the back here, where those wires are, is a big black battery from a remote control car or plane or something that I picked up at the electronics shop for 80 bucks. If you'd like to buy such an 11 volt battery, I'm happy to sell it to you because it's easier than taking it back on a plane. And so I started and I got lucky when I eventually got to plug in the battery in. The battery will quite happily power this robot for six hours or so. So I probably went with overkill, but overkill was fun. Um, so my next sort of problem was I needed a way to control the motors. So after some Googling, I found there is this board called a H-bridge. And similarly, I knew I needed to take, because I didn't want two batteries, I knew I needed to take the 12 volts-ish that I was using to drive the motors and make five volts for some processes. And again, I knew there was a thing called voltage regulators. So I did some Googling. And now, I am probably a competent enough electrical person that I could Google the circuit diagrams, buy all the components, build some dodgy looking circuit boards. But on the other hand, you can buy these boards for $5 off the internet. So why would I make them myself? And so the top one there is the H-bridge, which is the motor controller. It sits, let's see if I can do this again without screwing up the world too much. There you go. It's sitting right down in the back where that LED is and those wires are coming from. And talk a bit more about that in a second. And then we have our wonderful voltage regulator up there telling my battery, me and my battery is running at 12 volts. And so, again, that's just another thing that made doing this project much quicker, simpler, and easier. So coming on to the interesting bit for Linux people, choosing a processor. So I happened to go with the Android C1 because at the time, whichever Raspberry Pi was available was, it was before the Raspberry Pi 3, and the Raspberry Pi that was available was very, was underperformed compared to everything else on the market. I wanted to mess with some video. It didn't do video, and so I went with an Android. In hindsight, it was not a great choice, 
because it never got kernel support, and so you were basic, if you wanted to do what I wanted to do, being an operating systems person and run my own operating system on it, it was basically impossible. So this is still running kernel 3.4 because it is the only kernel they ever had. And it has a hack together OpenSUSE user space probably from a year and a half ago because I'm scared if I update it now, it'll want new kernel features and everything will break. As an side note, for this project, I was going to swap it to a Raspberry Pi 3, but Raspberry Pi 3s now use the dedicated serial port for Bluetooth. And the software serial port they leave you with didn't work with this, and so there is some configuration I can redo to disable the Bluetooth, but I didn't get that done in time. So we still have an iDroid rather than a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, a second piece of advice is get a serial get a serial debug cable because when you turn on your board and the ethernet doesn't come up, short of plugging in a monitor, keyboard and mouse to see what's actually happening, you have no idea what's going on. Whereas if you get a serial cable, you can just launch a shell and go, oh, my, my Wi-Fi network's changed or something like that and you can go in and you can reconfigure it and it makes your life easy. So if you go that way, Get a serial cable, it makes your life easy. And then on the Arduino side, which I'll talk about why I went for an Arduino a bit later, but I've got this board up the top called an Ala mode. It sits nicely on the Raspberry Pi's GPIO headers. It deals happily with the fact that Raspberry Pi GPIO is generally 3.3 volts, and Arduino is 5 volts, and it just makes everything work. And so that's a wonderful piece of gear that's saved a bit of time and looks neat and tidy. And then at the same time, I bought a little LCD screen because it was $30 more, so why wouldn't you? <laughs> so the next probably sort of systems engineering -y concept that I'm going to talk about is based off the fact that I am a great person for starting a project and then putting it down and leaving it on the shelf and never really doing much more with it. Hence the reason this robot has been like this for a year and a half since I started being able to drive it and decided that was fun. And why would I do more? Um, but I didn't want to go to the effort of spending four or five hundred dollars on various electronics equipment, only to have it sitting on the shelf doing nothing for the rest of its life, like many of my other projects. So I thought to myself, I'll start by getting a processor and make all that work. And if I get that far, then I will order the things I need to drive a motor. And so when I got that far, I thought, well, if I can drive a motor, I'll probably go to the effort of putting all those things onto a robot chassis. So I went ahead and bought the chassis and then the battery. And as a rough idea of cost, I think the chassis was $150, $200. You can get bigger ones and smaller ones that are more expensive and more cheaper. Oddly enough, the next most expensive thing is the batteries, which are about 80 bucks. Again, as I've found, you could probably get a smaller one, but these ones work. And then you have the Adroid, the screen, and so forth. And as you can see there, I have a big long list of things that I would like to do somewhere in the future. I also have a box of Meccano I found at a local secondhand shop so that I can build more things on top of it to add more things, but I've got, I want to do some video streaming. I want to give it a GPS and a compass so it actually knows where it is. And I want to write a better UI for it because its current UI was hacked together in a night. And then who knows, maybe one day it'll get Skynet and it'll be able to drive itself around my house. Skynet will never happen because we never finished purchase. <laughs> exactly. And so going a bit further into the details of how my setup sort of works. So on the left top, on the left hand side, I have a phone or a laptop or whatever device that I'm using Wi-Fi and WebSockets to talk to the Linux processor. And at the moment it's doing basic things like saying go forwards, go left, go right, or at that sort of level. And then all the Odroid is really doing is taking the stuff that's coming in off the Wi-Fi and spitting it down a serial port to the Arduino. And then the Arduino controls the H-bridge, 
which takes a bunch of GPIO from the Arduino and gives you two 12 volt lines that if you want it to go at full speed, it'll be 12 volts. If you want it to go at quarter speed, it'll be three volts or something. And so on that bit, this is for those of you who want to build something like this but haven't ever got that far. So a common way of doing this is something called PWM or pulse width modulation, which I've shown up the top. And it's basically a square wave. And if you want us to travel at zero, it's basically zero volts as a binary signal. If you want it to be at 25%, as you can see up the top, a quarter of the time it'll spend its time high, three quarters of the time it'll send itself low, then 75% is the opposite, and you get three to 100 where it's always up. And Arduino has a nice, what, a nice function you can use to set, I think you pick a number between zero and 255, and then the Arduino hardware will automatically make this square wave for you. And so alongside a speed for each motor, I have a forwards, and it, it takes a forwards and a backwards to tell it which way the motor should spin. And so probably if you were going to make a robot, that the easiest way is to get a H-bridge, write some Arduino to do this, and then from the Arduino figure out what else you want to do and how else you want to do it. And so the Arduino code, which I won't show you today, it's living in my GitHub repository. <laughs> my GitHub repository will also contain the slides for this afterwards when I get to uploading them and everything else in the design. And so in the interest of providing all the diagrams and all the details, in terms of the electrical circuit tree, Again, it is very simple because I didn't want to spend my time on it because I'd find it boring. And so basically what we have is two, three boards and there is just some horrible prototyping wires holding them all together. And so as you can see, we've got the battery is 12-ish volts. And so then that goes to a voltage regulator, which creates the five volts to drive the processor and then the 12 and the 5 volts go into the H-bridge to drive the motors. And that is all the circuitry there is, as shown to you on these couple of slides. So another systems engineering concept is modular design. We want to make things modular because it gives us a lot of flexibility. So if we go into why I chose WebSockets. So WebSockets are everywhere now. You can write some JavaScript in your browser to send data down a WebSocket. You can, in my previous job, I had used them with the Qt UI libraries. And so I thought, that's easy. I can make a Qt application, run it on my laptop, run it on my phone. I'll use WebSockets to talk to the Adroid. There's a Python WebSockets library I can run on the server, and everything will just work. And if I want to one day have a website that's monitoring the, lap the robot because it's doing more things and has more sensors, I can add that easily. If I just want a simple way to drive it from my phone, which I have at the moment, I can do that easily. And so the joy of having clear breaks is you can change things, you can add things really easily. And so similarly, serial is a universal. Everything does serial. Every library under the sun, all of it does serial. And so again, it's a nice modular thing. And who knows, maybe one day I will replace the Arduino on this robot chassis with something like this, which is the end goal, right? Because we want big, fun robots. But I don't have the money for that. And theoretically, one day, I would be able to take everything on the left-hand side of this, rewrite some stuff that manages to drive a Bobcat somehow, and then we would be good. So also talk a little bit about the concept of event-driven programming. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with writing software. 
those of you who do it a lot will have been taught this concept. Some of you might know software as you write a script, you start at the top of your code, you finish at the end. So how do you handle something that is always going and has events changing? And so we use something called event-driven programming, which basically is you have a while true loop and it sits there doing nothing until something happens. And so in the Python library, which I admit is very over-engineered because I wanted to be prepared for it to do anything. And for me, that was the fun bit. And so the fun bit I've done myself, whereas everything else I've got other people to do. Um, so we have three, three threads running. One is we're going to start at the bottom because that's a more sensible place. So I did this diagram upside down. So if you start on the UI, if I press the forwards button, a message will come in from the web sockets and that is sitting in its own thread so it's not blocking anything else off. And so I take that message and I put it in a queue and then in my main bit of software, it is basically just looping infinitely going, is there something in the queue yet? No, I'll go back to sleep. Is there something in the queue but yet? No, I'll go back to sleep. Is there something in the queue? Yes, this person said go forwards. So I will now tell the Arduino uh, via the serial port, go forwards. And so then it goes up and out the top through the Arduino and the Arduino sends a message back saying, I've set the motors to this speed for you. And so then you get a message coming the other way back down through the threads and that way nothing is ever blocking each other. Everything will work concurrently and so that is the main concept of event-driven programming. Now let's, so onto a demo. So I'm going to take this robot and bring it back up here and we'll play with the demo gods because, so here you can see my, let's use a mouse, you can see my very basic <coughs> QT application. Obviously, I designed this for a smartphone, and it is of the right size that it fits on my laptop, on my, there you go, on my laptop screen at home and my phone, and it's fixed size because I was lazy. As I said, I was a UI developer. For me, using QT to write an Android application made sense because I already had everything on my laptop. You probably won't have that, and so you might write a native Android application or some JavaScript or something like that. But the joy of WebSockets is you could do all of those things if you wanted. And so this is my dodgy application that I wrote in a night. And then on another night, I added a speed controller. And so got forwards, got spinning that. I think when I wired this up, I wired it the wrong way because I think I'd like it to spin the other way when I press that button. And the most important button of all is this button in the middle, which is an emergency stop because the downside to Wi-Fi is if you're at a maker fair or something where everyone is using Wi-Fi, you can't go very far before your Wi-Fi is no longer the strongest Wi-Fi and you run into issues. So having an emergency stop that just goes stop doing whatever you were doing is wonderful because these buttons will send through a go and then a stop when I let go. But if, one of, if the stop gets missed, then you have an emergency stop for safety. And now one of the joys of QT is I have exactly the same application here on my phone. And so while I can drive it on my laptop, if the application was working properly. I could also drive it on my phone. And I need to bring the speed up because carpet is sticky. And so this is good fun. You guys can all come have a turn afterwards if you want. And that is the essence of what it does at the moment. There is a webcam on the front, 
which uses VLC's ASCII rendering to render onto the screen at the front because I didn't get as far as streaming it to anything. And I thought that's a fun use for the screen and the webcam until I do something better with it. One day I'd like the screen to show nice, a nice UI of like how fast the motors are going and useful debugging information like the application has started, you can now control it because at the moment I don't have any of that. And so, let's come back to, so in summary, the things I have learned while doing this project is the joy of open source is by taking a bunch of things done by different people, different libraries, different components, and all sorts of things. You can make yourself something really cool in a pretty short amount of time. If you, if you, spend, the, if you spend a night or two looking at what's around for whatever project you want to do in the open source world, and then your problem just becomes, how do I make these components come together and you get to spend a lot more time doing the fun bits and less time doing the boring bits. So, also, modular designs with common protocols are really good. It means that, theoretically, I can change my Odroid to a Raspberry Pi when I make the serial work, and that should have been a two-day job, which is the amount of time I left for it before the conference, <laughs> which, in hindsight, was possibly a bad idea, but these things happen. You should use the right tools for the job because it'll make your life easier, or close enough to the right tools anyway. And just build yourself a robot. It's lots of fun. There is kits out there for everyone. If you're much more of an electrical person and you struggle with software, there is kits you can get and hack with. There is Lego kits. There is all sorts of kits. Make, go home, make yourself a robot. It's a lot of fun. You can drive it around. You can impress people. Your kids will really enjoy it. And so I'm going to leave a fair bit of time for questions. But before I do, I'd like to say thank you to Sousa because they are nice enough to fund my travel and accommodation. We are hiring at the moment. If you want to come and work for an awesome ex organisation, I think there is 114 jobs available around the world. Our, I'll say our recruiting website is not the best. And so most, a lot of the jobs list an office but if there is global anywhere mentioned in the subject line, if you are the right person, you might be able to work remotely. And so finally, I'd like to thank the conference organizers. And do you have any questions? Any questions, anyone? I'll do the running around. What was your total cost for your materials for this? Um, it would be under five hundred dollars at the moment, but a little bit un but not by much. I haven't spent the time adding it all up. Again, there is cheaper kits you can use if you already have a Raspberry Pi at home. That helps. What are you doing for, for battery power management? How do you you tell tell your robot how much battery it's got left and do you do anything in particular when it's running low? Um, I have, which I haven't set up because I didn't bring the right adapter, um, remote control planes come with a little thing with LEDs and a siren so that when your LiPo battery gets below a certain point, it'll scream at you and go stop using it. Mm -hmm. For now, the voltage reg... Oh, I better drive it back to me so I can... <laughs> it's doing all the way over there. So I have the, I decided to spend the extra $2 and get a voltage regulator which has a nice LCD display of the current battery. Mm -hmm. And for now I am doing it manually by looking at if the battery goes below 10 volts then I'll turn it off and charge it. It does have, the batteries do have a way of monitoring them. I haven't got to the point of integrating that into the application yet. Okay, thank you. If you want some help with your serial issues, um, find me later. No worries. Um, I may have missed this part of the talk, um, uh, but you said that you weren't streaming that video to anywhere. Um, does that mean next year you're going to do part two where you implement OpenCV? Um, possibly when I get 
the time and it's the next thing on my list that people commonly ask for and would be a cool addition. What's the point of the Arduino? Could you not just go straight from the Odroid to the motors and have a motor controller? Or if you upgrade to the Raspberry Pi, use a motor controller and the Raspberry Pi direct? Um, the point was, for me, it was easy. So GPIO on Linux is, because I also wanted to expand it to possibly do more things later. And so GPIO on Linux is um, not the easiest sometimes. But I could have probably done it without the Arduino. But at the same time, it took me a night to write the amount of Arduino code required to take some serial ports and turn on a motor. It's not very complex. And so I went that way. And that's the same reason why I used Arduino rather than using AVRC, which I also know and I'm very familiar with. That would have taken three or four nights and some horrible debugging versus the night. So. So, um, kind of a vague question: How much processing power do you need when you're you're using the? Um, I'm considering. Yesterday we did the FPGA and we had an open risk soft core on an FPGA. Would that get it done, or is it not going to get it as far as running um, on this thing? At the moment, it doesn't need very much of the processing power it has in terms of for actually taking stuff from the serial from the web sockets and sending it to the serial. It is negligible, almost nothing on a. Adroid or a Raspberry Pi. The reason I went for a bigger processor is because later on I'll probably want to do more things and it'll make it easier for me to add more things later and have some extra room. Um, so if you were going to have uh, offload some of the processing, say, to an external camera with an external computer, giving it more executive control, how would you tie that into your software? Sorry, could you repeat that? If you're gonna, if you're gonna have, say, an exterior computer with an exterior camera looking at it to understand the environment better, instead of localized sensors, how would you change your software to cope with that uh, split brain? So, at the moment, my the way I, for me, that all that software part was the fun part, and so my Python application is over-engineered debuggery, and so I would eventually get to the point of either um, if the processing could be done internally on the machine, then I'd be doing it internally on the Raspberry Pi and just sending the right signals through the Python app. If I was offloading it to, the, to another machine, then I would use the same WebSockets protocol I'm using to drive it. And so I'd do all my image recognition somewhere else and go based on what I can see and what my sensors know. I want to go this far, this way, and so I'd do that. But it's, it's the next point that I would like to get to eventually, but haven't really spent the time thinking about to go into detail. But hopefully with the modular concepts I've used, I've left myself enough space to make it not hard to do. Do we have anyone else? We've still got plenty of time. So. Well, you can always catch up with Simon. Uh, you'll be around, yep. of course, for the rest of the conference, everybody. Um, now, we've got a little something here from the organisers for you to pre say thank you for all thank your you. time. And everybody make them feel welcome.